Hello and welcome to our industry symposium focused on improving transplant outcomes with advanced donor heart preservation and transport. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and thank you all for joining us today. ISHRT has always offered our community a truly unique experience that allows us to come together and celebrate the very latest research in our field. I am so proud to stand beside our incredible panel of speakers today and showcase the impact of our advanced organ preservation devices. The past year has shown tremendous growth for our clinical community, which we at Paragonics see every day. Our advanced organ preservation devices have safely transported over 1,800 organs and we proudly support over 60 customers across the United States and Europe. In the United States, we are humbled to be the chosen partner for heart preservation by over a third of all heart transplant centers. Together, we have furthered the science of organ transplantation and preservation, and we will only experience further growth in 2022. Already, Paragonix has, has made significant strides to improve our support for our transplant partners. We have also made significant progress in our Guardian series of clinical registries focused on researching the impact of organ preservation on clinical transplant outcomes. The Guardian Heart Registry has now reached over 1,200 enrolled patients across 17 transplant centers globally, and the results of the registry have been truly remarkable. We are committed to expanding research related to improving patient outcomes, and in line with that goal, I'm honored to introduce our expert panelists for today's symposium. Please welcome Dr. Andreas Zuckermann from the Medical University of Vienna, Austria, Dr. Jeffrey Tudeberg from Stanford Healthcare, and Dr. David D'Alessandro from Massachusetts General Hospital. Our first speaker is Dr. Zuckermann from the Medical University of Vienna. We have a completely different donor population, yes, for sure, but, but I found out uh, some other members who would be willing to talk about it, and in 2013, John Kapashigawa and I built up this very wonderful consensus meeting on primary graft dysfunction that now really, I think, sets the stage. I think definitely, as cardiac surgeons, this is not the way how to select. So if you take out the donor heart and look at the recipient heart, they should be different. They should look the same, bad. Um, and then everybody who has done transplant, you know how these hearts look like that you take out of these poor patients. Uh, very important in, in everything what you do, Europe is different. We do not have a lot of, only a lot of different languages than the U.S. Um, we have a very, very mixed population also in the U.S., but our donor age is significantly older than in the U.S., and this is data from the ISHLT. Not completely new, but it hasn't changed. It's still the same. You will read it in the next part uh, of our uh, registry. So it's about median age of 40 years, these are the donors that we accept. In the US, it's still lower. Reasons are known, different. Again, data from the ISHIT registry clearly show ischemic time has an impact on death after transplantation, early death. And this is also associated uh, with donor age. So the higher the donor age, the longer the ischemic time, the higher the risk that these patients won't survive over the first year. And Looks very nice and pretty clear, but when you look at our, this is just my personal experience, this is our median donor age in Vienna, 44.5 years, and we're going now up to 60, 62 years. So we're already in the high risk. And we looked at about the median ischemic time in our donor transplant population. You can see the median ischemic time today is four hours, which was normally said this is the upper limit of an ischemic time. So we are always, almost always in the high risk population. And we struggled in the mid 2000s with a high rate of primary graft dysfunction. 
So the question is, could the standard of heart transplant preservation be improved? Yes, of course, yes, always. We heard a lot about different new technologies. There are some new preservation solutions on the horizon. And here, because this is, of course, the Paragonics Lunch Symposium, we're talking about the Sherpa Park, which uh, you have this wonderful picture here, and you have this very, very nice gadget that you exactly know where your team is going if they're really taking the shortest route back from the hospital. And of course, you have this temperature log that you really see this, this heart is really uh, at the same temperature. Um, but when we started to use it, I immediately had a lot of discussions with, with Mrs. Anderson about, so if you want to really get this started, you need to work on science. Even though you are approved, uh, everybody can buy it, can use it. You need to work in science to convince uh, the users, us, um, to use it, and and I, I, I can't thank you enough, Lisa, for, for doing that, that you really put together this registry, the Guardian registry that was started, I think it was the kickoff in 2019 uh, at the uh, last ISHLT meeting where we were sitting face to face with each other. Um, and look at that. So the enrollment, it took some time to enroll patients, but now we are more than 1,000 patients are included in this Guardian registry. Partly, preserved uh, with the Shepherd Park, partly preserved with uh, um, static storage on ice. So, and I said, well, we have to do some granularity work in that. So giving you some retrospective historical analysis, so we, when we started to use the Shepherd, said, okay, we will use it in the absolute high-risk population with high-risk donors. And just to give you some, some, some insight, recipient media age almost 60, most of them were male, uh, the indications for transplant are typically, but so one third of our population of ad patients, but we also had the heart made six total artificial heart, um, where we preserve the heart with the SHEP. Uh, 10% were ECMOs, so we do not have the allocation rules in the US. ECMO, we are one of the few centers who are really aggressive in ECMO bridge the transplantation. And two thirds were high urgent. I would, uh, would say that's one to three in the new um, allocation classification of the US. Um, and even 21% of those patients had an infection pretty close to the transplant. So if you are familiar with the impact score, which is a recipient risk score, uh, validated uh, to predict one year mortality after transplantation, those were eight, so it predicts around 17 to 20% mortality, which is a high risk population. The same with the donors, and this is a European donor population, 40 years median age, um, Noepinephrine, all of them received noepinephrine. Uh, there were 40% more than 0.2 micrograms. Uh, and two inotropic or vasopressor drugs, uh, at least in 15% of these donors. We had some rate of patients with less than 50, uh, donors with less than 50% ejection fraction, 20% of hypertrophic hearts, hypernatremia in 20%, and 40% of these donors were under CPR, with half of them a CPR time above 20 minutes. And an ischemic time, a median ischemic time of 201. These were selected. Not all of our patients, not all of donors are like that, but we selected the highest risk, and about half of them were more than 240 minutes. So we have the Eurotransplant donor risk score that predicts acceptance or non-acceptance of a donor heart in the European, um, in the Eurotransplant area, so it would be an estimated non-acceptance rate of 40%. So 40% of these hearts normally would not be accepted. Uh, and the donor risk index, again, an American donor risk index, expected mortality of 20%. Well, we had a primary graft dysfunction rate of 10% uh, in this population and in hospital mortality of 20%, most of them due to infection. Uh, so high risk. Um, of course, this is something that you might not be able to do in the U.S. because the UNOS Grim Reaper is always in your neck. In Europe, it's a little bit easier, but we have this different donor population. Based on that, we also work now on our Austrian experience. Um, as you can expect, these patients had a long stay in the hospital and on the ICU, but what we could see some kind of uh, primary graft dysfunction lower rate when we used the SHEP. Uh, um, and in a routine way, and not only in these in these high risk patients, and exactly that was by coincidence also in the pandemic time when it started. So we, had, we saw some lower rates of of primary graft dysfunction, not exactly severe, but lower rates of primary graft dysfunction and less use of ECMO. So that we we thought 
that is pretty interesting, and we were really looking forward what's going on. What will the Sherpa um, um, pack have an impact? What will the Guardian Registry say? And, and I think a lot of you were uh, when when uh, when we heard um, yesterday the first the first data or was Wednesday the first data about our one year transplant um, survivals. And and I think this is one of the most intriguing slides. So showing U.S. centers um, with their standard of care in the old times, the, um, the risk for, um, for severe primary graft dysfunction defined as you cannot wean a patient of bypass without a mechanical uh, support, and how this changed when the Sherpa was implemented. So you can see not, none of them uh, had an increase, all of them had a decrease, and of course some centers were very good before that, but they're now very good after that, but some of them really seem to have a problem with around almost 30% primary graft dysfunction, they really could lower um, this incidence. But we said, okay, should the problem is you might compare apples to oranges if you have not a prospective randomized trials. And I, I insisted when I discussed uh, with, with Paragonics and also my co co-workers from the Guardian Registry, we need to have something as close as it can get to a prospective randomized trial. Well, you have to do a propensity score matched cohort and compare it um, with the ice um, preservation and the Sherpa Park preservation. And working on that, uh, where we looked, okay, mm, we tried to find to balance out the ischemic times, the area distribution, because there was this change of, of the allocation rules in the US, and also the size distribution um, of the center. And with that, we found out, not we, but the computers found out, uh, almost 150 patients in each cohort that we could, could compare uh, as close as it gets to a prospective randomized trials. And very interesting. So it was balanced in the ischemic time. It was balanced in the area. Still, the discussion, well, a little bit different in the mechanically assist devices, and you heard from the PGD consortium that um, durable VATs might be associated with a higher rate of primary graft dysfunction, but we will work in that direction, so we will put this, um, this variable also into place. But to our astonishment, or to our surprise, positive surprise, we found out there seems to really to be a significant impact when using the Sherpa Park um, in behalf of severe primary graft dysfunction. We know that P patients so mostly do not die due to primary graft dysfunction itself. Hearts can recover, but we know they die of the collateral damage of infection, multi-organ failure. So I think it also had an impact um, on one-year survival. And in the couple of my analysis now with this huge patient population, we could show that there's a significant difference um, when using the Sherpa Park compared um, to ICE. We also looked at what happens in these longer distance, more than four hours of ischemic time. It seems to be have even a bigger impact there that the difference was, was even more significant. And this also had some impact on one year survival um, after transplantation. We also did an analysis in marginal donor hearts. And I always say, well, the marginal donor heart in the US is the routine donor heart in Europe, but this Guardian Registry is still very US focused because not that many European centers have put the data in, we have done. Um, and we, we use this similar um, 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 definition of a marginal donor heart uh, based on more than four hours of ischemic time or more than two hours plus one of the following comorbidities. So older donor, uh, longer donor downtime with CPR, history of diabetes, um, uh, impaired ejection fraction, uh, hypertrophic hearts, and donor luminal irregularities on the coronary angiogram. And even here, we could see uh, a trend and partly also a significant difference between those two donor populations. So I think we need more data to show it also in these marginal donor hearts, but there is a lot, there's a lot of data out there and everybody who wants to cooperate in the Guardian Registry, uh, you're happily invited to work with us uh, to get more insight into the data. We also have our first um, information and data on the pediatric um, experience. Of course, the numbers are small, so we cannot see anything in, in, in any significant impact, but uh, we could see, um, uh, based on this population, there seems to be some benefit also in these pediatric hearts, but we have to wait for more data uh, to see um, if, if it really shows up the first signs, so, so the, if it's really a signal or it's just noise. Um, 
So overall, I don't talk too much about lungs. Uh, the, uh, there has been also a, a guardian uh, lung um, registry, and they also could show it seems to be a, have an impact. It's pretty new. Uh, so I think it will be very interesting uh, to, to hear about that um, during the next um, ISHLT meeting. So in summary, our early experience in high-risk cases was, was positive. This is why we moved forward. Um, I think the Guardian Registry data shows a strong signal for improved donor heart protection with the Sherpa Park. We saw a significantly lower rate of severe primary graft dysfunctions in the matched cohort. There was a lower rate for need for mechanical support, uh, post-transplantation in the matched cohort. And we could see we could show that longer transport times are possible. There is a potential benefit in marginal donor hearts. There is a potential benefit in pediatric hearts, but definitely more data will be needed. And definitely this will be followed because Guardian is alive and, and, and working very well. And I'm looking forward to see more of this data in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. So these are my disclosures, including a note of disclosure from Paragonics for speaking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the background of kind of the, the landscape in the U.S. in terms of longer distances traveled to get our organs. I'll talk a little bit about Stanford's kind of initial experience with uh, the Paragonics device and some comparison to sort of our historical controls. It's a little hard to follow up a thousand patient registry with sort of our local experience, but maybe I can give you just some of our thoughts as we've kind of gone through this uh, process of changing the way we uh, obtain and, and preserve our donor hearts. So certainly everybody in the U.S. is familiar with the fact that the allocation changed in 2018 and how it's impacted uh, how far we go. So when you look at any of one of a number of studies, this not that this one study in particular, but I think they all show this, that we're going further. And as a result of us going further, the cold ischemic times are getting longer. But one of the benefits is we've seen the patients are actually not waiting quite as long because of the change in the way we allocate the hearts and more statuses, among other things. So how has that sort of impacted Stanford? So how have we seen this? If you look at uh, our numbers sort of over time, this is a little bit backwards from maybe the way you're used to looking at, but the more recent data is on the left and the, the more distant data is on the right. And if you go back to sort of the old way that we allocated hearts in terms of DSAs and then increasing distances, you can see that it was we've gotten closer to the left-hand side of the curve, more uh, more recent data. We've gotten fewer and fewer of our hearts from what was the uh, uh, old DSA We've got, started going a little bit further from the, the next step out in terms of 500 nautical miles, and then 1,000 and 15 and over have become sort of relatively routine in our practice. But at the same time, our program has grown too, so we've managed to, to, to increase our uh, transplant volume over that time, despite the fact we're having to go further to get our hearts. And so what's Stanford's program like? Well, we've generally been pretty aggressive. So this is data from our SRT, our reports. They kind of compare the way you accept hearts and the kind of hearts you accept with everybody else and create a bell curve and show where you are. So the CASU, that's Stanford. And so we're kind of many standard deviations over to the right-hand side for, for our overall acceptance when we're willing to accept risk. So depending on sort of how you look at that, the PHA's increased risk kind of looks the same in terms of those donors. Looking at offers over offer number 50, we're kind of way out there. Donor age, 40 or more, we're kind of way out there. And so we see the same thing with going over 500 miles. We're kind of way out there. So we're used to going very far. Um, but at the same time, I think it's helped in that we've been able to get our patients transplanted faster as well. That graph in the bottom there that's, that's oriented the, uh, vertically rather than horizontally is the likelihood ratio of getting transplanted. In our center, it's about three and a half times what you would expect because our program is big and then we can afford to take risk. And so therefore, we're aggressive. So how has this changed the location, the location of our donors and, and how we look at uh, hearts in California? So the middle of that circle is San Francisco, and the, and the circle is 500 nautical miles. And so it used to be that we would have access to our local DSA, which was around the, the San Francisco area. And so that was about 7.8 million to, uh, people. And uh, John Kabashigawa and the programs in LA would have access to a lot more local hearts. They had about you know, 13 million people. But with going out the 500 nautical miles, we're all competing with each other across the state of California now to get our hearts. So how has that impacted us? Well, 
you know, we, when we think about transporting those hearts, 50 years ago, we'd say, okay, we'll put it on a bucket of ice and bring it to Stanford. But the honest thing is now we're still mostly thinking about putting in a bucket of ice and transferring it to Stanford. And then there's other things coming along, including paragonics. But you think, like, you know, what has changed in the past 50 years in transplant? A lot has changed in the past 50 years in transplant, including me. I've, if I've changed this much in the past 50 years, how come we can't change how we transport a heart from one place to the next? That's a little, little fat kid. Um, so. Our surgeons started saying, boy, when we do these long distance procurements that comes back and like the right ventricles frozen and other parts of the heart aren't as well preserved and what can we do? So that's, how, that's kind of what initially prompted us to, to start using the Sherpa pack. And so these are uh, some of the temperature runs that Andreas mentioned before from looking at short runs to long runs. And you can see that we're able to maintain the donor heart within a relatively narrow uh, temperature range, kind of regardless of how long we're transporting that heart. So when we first started to kind of look and say, okay, how would our results look like over the first six months or so? And these weren't used in all of our transplants, but increasingly most of our transplants. So the hearts are where the hospitals were that we were getting our donors from. And the number below it is the miles away from San Francisco in just sort of straight line distances when you Google it um, to just give you a sense of sort of where they were coming from. So over a relatively short period of time, about six months, the latter half of 2020, when you looked at the total hearts that we procured but with the Sherpa pack was just under 50 and the mean ischemic time was 254 minutes and the distance traveled as a mean was 622 miles. And so to give you a sense of outcomes, so the blues, when the hearts turn blue, that means that heart had PGD and we define PGD as need for MCS, so anything, a balloon pump or higher, and most of them were balloon pumps. So there are six episodes of PGD, four or six totally recovered, and we just defined totally recovered as an EF of 60% or greater. And there was one death, and that death was procured from LA. So it wasn't a death procured from a long way away. And the median length of stay in the hospital is about 18 days. Our UNOS uh, and SRTR reports were median is about 17 or 18 days. And so as we, we saw this, we're like, hey, we're getting more comfortable going further away. And so the question is sort of how far can we push it? And the furthest we pushed it in kind of this thing is going to Alaska. So how far away is Alaska Anchorage from, from San Francisco? It's about 2,000 miles. And so for our European colleagues, 2,000 miles is about the straight line distance between Barcelona and Moscow. And so you can see that the ischemic time was 428 minutes, pretty long time. But it was a younger donor. That it, was eight, it was size matched well. And there was absolutely no PGD in that donor. So we started using it pretty routinely, and now we use it for just about every, for every transport. So I'll just show you some data looking at our historical controls compared to what we do now. So it's, you know, it's roughly 60-60 in terms of ice transport and Sherpa transport. And you can see the time periods. It goes to, to the middle of 2020. Prior to that was ice. After that was almost exclusively Sherpa pack. Um, for this particular analysis, we're excluding multi-organ uh, transplants, and there was one patient that didn't consent to being in our database, so that person was excluded as well. So we wanted to look at things like you've heard from Andreas in terms of death, PGD, again defined as a bloom pump or higher in terms of the need for support, length of stays, and ejection fraction. And when you look at the baseline characteristics, there's not much a difference between these two groups. There are more VADs in the older cohort, not surprisingly, again, this thing is just reflective of sort of what's happened in the US after the 2018 allocation change. So overall ischemic time, a pretty broad range of ischemic times for both group, but statistically significantly longer in the group from the Sherpa pack, 255 versus 230 minutes. And so for the graph to give you a sense of sort of what's changed before and after, so the blue hearts are the hearts from the ice storage, and they're going to go out to the center of the OPO. So wherever the OPO's office is located, it's because it got too messy on the map because there are too many hearts, and it ends up just being a blue, blue mash. And the numbers below them are a number of hearts from that OPO. So this is what it looked like before we started using the Sherpa pack. So mostly concentrated on the West Coast. And afterwards, we started going further and further, all the way out to Kansas, Texas, Dallas, to, to get our hearts. And so I think particularly for these long distance travel, I think we feel much more comfortable going that far using the Sherpa pack. So outcome wise, I already mentioned the difference in ischemic time. The length of stay was about the same between the two groups. You know, you can say, well, the, the Sherpa packs were a little bit longer trying to control for some of the other patient factors, it, it, it does sort of even that out a little bit, but I won't get into the gory details here. PGD rates were the same. And when you look at EF, both at six months and one year, there wasn't any difference. And the overall ejection fraction was normal, about 60%. 
When you look at overall survival, the red is the Sherpa pack, the blue is uh, preservation and ice, and there wasn't a statistical significant difference, and you know, survival was actually pretty good for all of our patients. This is a little bit complex. I tried to sort of say, well, if you look at ischemic time and uh, look at length of stay, maybe we could capture a sense of sort of the patients that struggled with primary graft dysfunction but didn't quite require mechanical circulatory support. So the ice is the, the with no PGD is a blue plus. If you have uh, PGD, it's a red plus, and the same thing with Sherpa, except for circles, and to make it a little bit easier to see, I sort of separated them out. So you can see in, the, in our ICE group, we had PGD that was sort of all over the place in terms of ischemic time. There wasn't necessarily a relationship to longer ischemic time. We saw the same thing with the Sherpa pack, maybe not quite so much PGD in some of the really short ischemic times, but again, not a huge association. What about, I'm sorry, this doesn't actually project very well, but we looked at sort of donor age in ischemic time because we wondered, well, maybe we're only going really far for young donors, right? Um, and so when we look both in the, our cold ice experience and our Sherpa experience, if donor age is on the bottom and ischemic is on the uh, y-axis, you can see there's really not a strong relationship between donor age and how far we're going. So we're still going far and oftentimes for donors that are on the older side, as uh, Andreas alluded to, is what they're doing in Europe. So, and again, procurement is, is changing. I think we're going longer and longer distances in the U.S., but the, the flip side to that is we're getting our patients transplanted more quickly. You know, we're a large, aggressive program, and we're looking for ways to go further to get our patients transplanted. And our initial experience kind of backed up by sort of a longer, longer experience, so again, not as long as the, the overall data that you see in, in the, the larger database for paragonics, we've been pretty comfortable going longer distances, having good outcomes for our patients, both in terms of need for mechanical circulatory support or just sort of longer hospital stays. We really haven't seen that in our patients who we've gone very long distances. So again, I think maybe in 50 more years, I don't know if I'm going to have a picture up there to show you that I'm still alive in 50 years, but hopefully we'll be doing something beyond just putting hearts in ice. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Dr. D'Alessandro from Massachusetts General Hospital. I want to uh, thank Paragonics for putting on this symposium. There clearly remains a lot of interest in this, uh, in this technology and this topic. I, I sort of thought of this as the least uh, exciting topic, but cost is really the, the, the information I think people want. Does it make sense to use this, advice, this device to, to add expense to what already is a pretty expensive endeavor? Uh, so we attempted to do that with a cost analysis, and we used the Guardian Registry, and I, I want to just point out Andreas is being a champion of that registry and how important that has been, because to at, a, at an individual center, you need a really big center like yours to be able to figure that out, whether this is a step forward, uh, because practices change and the temporal relationships change. So uh, outside of that, these registries are super important, and as as more and more data goes into the registry, the answers become, I think, clearer. So uh, we need more data in there. If those of you are, that are using the device or looking to use the device, we invite um, more participation in the registry, and we hope to get a lot more science out of the registry. So um, my first several slides are really background. They're a lot less prettier than Jeff's, <laughs> uh, but I'll go through them anyway. You all know that the, uh, the uh, Oregon allocation system has changed in 2018, and the reasons being, of course, to increase regional sharing to uh, provide access to organs for those most at risk of dying. Uh, and what that did, looking at the report in the first year, is of course it, it gave us a lot less access, uh, access to um, uh, organs in our own DSAs. And we had to travel further, about twice as far in zone A, which is um, more than 500 nautical miles, and three times uh, more often in zone B, which is 500 to 1,000 nautical miles. And looking at that, what that did to um, travel distances, it, you know, it, we're all traveling further to get the organs, as you know. And in that right-hand panel there, you see that um, it, it's translated into a longer ischemic time. That's 13% on average longer, but you can see a lot, you know, fewer hearts in that sort of less than three-hour time window. And we know that those types of, uh, of hearts and patients do quite well. Um, this is really interesting data. That's looking at um, each of those dots is a, is a transplant center, and those are colored by year there, 2018 in black, 2021 in blue. Uh, and it looks at variance in um, the, the, the change in longer ischemic times defined here is greater than three hours and changed in volume at each transplant center. 
And what you see is that linear relationship where centers that are doing more transplants are doing it by doing transplants with longer ischemic times. If you're not doing longer ischemic times, then your program is shrinking. And so we're all sort of interested in growing our programs. In order to do that, you have to go further to get organs, as Jeff has just shown you. Um, and, and most of us are familiar with this publication by, by Killich in uh, 2021. Um, and that just sort of highlighted some of the important changes that we've seen in the practice of transplant. We're transplanting more people off acute mechanical circulatory support, um, mostly uh, balloon pumps, but also ECMO, much uh, further distances. And um, concerningly, in that early analysis, we saw a decrement in patient survival. Now, it does appear that that's not been borne out in more recent data, and that's nice to see that we've learned how to operate within this new system so it doesn't come as such a mortality cost. But there are a lot of uh, individual center reports that are showing higher rates of PGD, and of course that can translate into worse long-term outcomes. Um, just what's happened in Massachusetts, similar to other places, we're getting a lot more organs outside our region, uh, a lot less access uh, to uh, organs within our region, and uh, showing that data just a little bit differently. Uh, going from 2018 to 2021, you can see that more than 50% of our organs now are coming, that's just at our program, are coming from more than 500 nautical miles away. So again, the, the, the risk profile of, of uh, our patients has changed over time with that allocation change. So the big question is, is there new technology that we can apply that can mitigate some of that risk and help us uh, improve our results? And is it cost effective to utilize it? So, um, you know, it, as you know, for 50 years, we've been using essentially a beer cooler. And when last I checked on Amazon, they maybe take it out of the slide, but the beer cooler was $150. And that's for a pretty nice one. Uh, you know, that's substantially more than $150, but it's also got a lot more technology uh, applied to it. So we attempted to answer the question using the Guardian registry. Um, the registry date I'm going to show you is a little bit different. Uh, than what you saw earlier because the uh, we did this earlier in the year and we stopped the data uh, in November 2021. These are the investigators that contributed uh, uh, patients. Uh, we looked at um, uh, 10 centers and we captured using Medicare cost reports and uh, hospital charge master reports the major components of cost associated with an index hospitalization uh, for a heart transplant. And as you see there's some variability um, uh, in those buckets uh, across uh, in institutions, but they're, they're mainly similar. And the big ticket items, again, as you would expect, are ICU stays, floor stays, and especially the application of uh, mechanical circulatory support, uh, which, is, um, which is this one. So that's the big one. There's a lot of also physician and other, other charges associated with that. So uh, again, to try to uh, make these groups comparable, we did um, some propensity matching to try to remove um, uh, confounding covariates. And we ended up with uh, two pretty well-matched cohorts of just under 90 patients. You can see that they're well-matched with respect to size, uh, age, uh, sex, uh, and uh, sex mismatching. Um, slightly higher sex mismatching in the ICE group, but uh, less female to male uh, in that group as well. Recipient characteristics also uh, quite similar um, with respect to uh, most of those baseline characteristics. You'll see that the ischemic time is slightly longer in the Sherpa group, um, uh, and both uh, on average more than three hours. So um, when I show you the outcomes data, remember that this is not a all-comers population. This is a population of patients that are on the longer side of ischemic time overall. Post-operative outcomes, uh, similar in a lot of things, what stands out the most is the need for mechanical circulatory support, quite high in total in the ICE group. Uh, ECMO and VAD was 26.4% uh, versus only 8%, and that translates into a severe PGD rate uh, that was uh, similarly uh, considerably higher in the ICE group, and that uh, did achieve statistical significance. Inotrope score, interestingly, not too different. Uh, length of stay and discharge outcomes. Um, we've seen this uh, uh, often when we slice this data up. You tend to see the ICU and the hospital length of stay being a little bit shorter. Um, and uh, But the uh, survival has been, uh, was trending towards improved at the time of this analysis. As you just saw, it has now achieved statistical significance uh, in the latest uh, uh, data draw. 
when you look at cost, there was no significant difference with respect to cost. If you just look at ICU stay and, uh, and regular room stay, that's probably because of small numbers, but you can see that the trend is towards increased cost, and that's just because of the longer uh, duration of stay. The big cost savings there uh, is, is in the application of MCS. You can see it's, of course, much more costly because it's used more often. And when you take these totals in aggregate, you can see a significant cost savings when, um, when the Sherpa pack is used. And, uh, and that's shown differently up here. And of course, the majority of that cost uh, we see in the reduction of PGD. And if you, can, if you can reduce that, it saves a lot of money. So just to conclude, the new allocation system has resulted, of course, in longer travel times and longer ischemic times. There's certainly a, a fair amount of data that there's higher observed PGD well, as well. It appears that the use of the Sherpa in the U.S. is clinically and cost beneficial as a donor heart preservation system versus ICE. The average cost was about $26,000 per patient, uh, which is substantial. And if this data held true across the whole country and everybody was using it, that could be a, a significant amount of money uh, that, 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 that we could save switching to this type of a technology. Um, so, uh, you know, before I... Before I end, I'm sure there's a lot of skeptics in the audience. I, I, I have been a big skeptic of this technology. Um, when we started using it, we were not having problems with PGD. Our outcomes were good. That frozen RV never really bothered me, to be honest. It, it softens up pretty quickly. Um, I thought it was worth looking at. It was intriguing, and we started using it. I was really happy that Andreas you know, convinced me that the Guardian Registry was something that we ought to participate in. And as we started to look at the data, we started to see very real differences. And you can sort of, you know, push them aside and explain them away. But the more data that gets in there, the bigger those differences are. And so people will often call me because they know I use it, and they'll say, you know, it's, it's expensive, you know, how can we afford to use it? And, I, you know, if the data continues to move in this direction, at some point the answer is going to be, how can you afford not to use it? It, it seems to make a very real difference. And, uh, at this point, I do believe in it, and I, I certainly agree that we should continue to collect data because that's important. And there's, you know, the data that we have is not perfect; it's not randomized data. But I'm not sure we're going to get there at this point because a lot of us are probably not willing to randomize, and the patients that both uh, that that you'd most expect will benefit from it. So, um, are we doing panel discussion now? Thank you all for your attention. I'd like to start by first saying thank you to all of our speakers. We really appreciate uh, their time and their support for the, the Guardian Registry. We spend a lot of time reviewing the data uh, with them. Uh, we'd like, like to open it now to any, any panel questions. Are there any, any, any questions in the audience? Yeah, Uri, you're the of your really, really great session. Thank you. Um, I just wanted on the cost analysis, I, I just want to point out that if you buy the beer cooler, you still have to buy the ice. Right, remember that. Um, I have a question for 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 Jeff. Uh, on your slides, it looked like even on ice in the ice group, you have very long uh, ischemic times. Yeah, I didn't really see a difference in the two uh, scatter plots. Uh, is that right? Is there something special that your surgeons do? Uh, so I saw a lot of uh, three hundred minutes uh, on ice. No, I mean we've. I think that uh, our surgeons have always, and our program has always been aggressive, just sort of in general, uh, in terms of how we've gone. We've statistically gone further with since we've sort of shifted over to the to the Paragonics device, um, and you know, and, and I think in a significant, it's statistically significant way, but also sort of in a clinically significant way. I think we're much willing to kind of go into sort of Kansas and the Dakotas and deep into the heart of Texas um, with with these devices. Danny Goldstein, also from Montefiore. <laughs> uh, is it possible to bring Dave's, uh, Dave's slides back? So what was your definition of severe PGD post-transplant? It was need for mechanical circulatory support for yep. severe. But how can you have a higher ECMO VAT transplant rate and a lower PGD? Isn't in every ECMO VAT post-transplant a PGD case? So that's within 24 hours. And it, it may be the time uh, capture was a little bit different. So we, it was 20, within 24 hours was the definition we used for severe. Is that Mike, right, Michael? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's correct. Within 24 hours, ECMO within 24 hours was considered severe PGD if there was post-operative day five or six 
that's included in the ECMO and VAD post-transplant. I've always been confused about that data with you guys, and that's, that's a good explanation. Yeah. The next slide also. The cost, Dave. Does a cost analysis include the cost of the device no. and those numbers? No. Okay, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, the question. Yeah, how does that differ? So, the, because the cost of the device does not get applied to the to the index hospitalization, it goes in an organ acquisition, and there's people that know a lot more than this than I. But but that that doesn't. So it, it comes out of a different cost bucket. Right. And yes, that would take away from that. Yeah. Okay. Good pickup. So I'm just just catching up the the confusion with ECMO post transplant primary graft dysfunction, I think this is what every preservation solution study preservation device study is 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 facing is how the definition is done. The definition was done by the consensus statement of the ISHLT. John and, and I put together this consensus conference in 2013, and I already talked to John that we have to update it a little bit because of the confusion, because there's a clear statement. Primary graft dysfunction is defined if you do not find any other cause, because you can have the need for ECMO to win a patient of bypass because the patient is bleeding like hell, or there might be respiratory problems where you need the ECMO as respiratory support, or even... God forbid that you have done a blood group incompatible that you didn't know and you have a hyperacute acute rejection and you need some and so so this is secondary graft dysfunction. This is something that, that we have to learn and, and and we went back and back to the data before we put together um, the, the, the abstract that we really find out and went back to each and every case on ECMO. Was this really PGD? Was there another cause? And we contacted um, the other uh, investigators and ask and tell us about the story of this patient. Why did he go on ECMO? And, and in the end, I think we, we divided it pretty well into the right things. And I have to tell you, Jeffrey, when I saw the U.S., uh, where you're already going, said, oh, my God, next time he comes to Europe and takes off. I'll give you a call when we're flying over. He doesn't want to you guys <laughs> want. Any more questions? Well, with that, I'd like to conclude this symposium. Thank you very much for all of your attendance. Truly appreciate it.